How has analytics changed maintenance over the decades? Oh, uh, this, as I said, there are really, really tangible results on safety side, on sustainability side, mm-hmm. and uh, as well as on the saving sides for the total cost of ownership. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it's, uh, I think, on even intangibles like safety, uh, is is massive uh, because you don't have to wait till a inspector will go and do the regular checks Mm -hmm. as per the plan, as per the schedule. Mm -hmm. Here, you can get the information 24-7. And and it has really huge benefits. As I mentioned briefly, as technology becomes reliable and cost competitive, I think it's a massive area for the growth for the whole industry. Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to our channel, please consider subscribing to it and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss an update. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very accomplished and senior professional from the UK, currently in India, Sanjay Rajasthan. Sanjay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Sanjay is the Managing Director of Omnicon Balfour BT, a company that provides predictive maintenance and data analytics and infrastructure, mainly for transportation, uh, i.e. rail, road, bridges, and data analytics. He was formerly President Global Services of DW, DYWIDAG, and he's worked with several technology companies. So Sanjay, let's talk a little bit about Omnicon uh, Balfour BT. Tell me about this business. Well, it's a very fascinating business. Uh, what we do is we actually bring technology uh, for measurements of all different assets, infrastructure, rail tracks, mm-hmm. so, that, so that we can do prevent and predict maintenance so that that brings safety, sustainability, as well as savings for the customer. Mm-hmm. And, and as the technology will go more competitive and the prices actually become competitive as the volumes go up. Uh, I think we see more and more um, basically infrastructure industry using this kind of technology mm-hmm. for for basically preventive analytics and then uh, maintenance. Okay. And, uh, you know, you are in multiple businesses, which is the rail, road, bridges and, you know, so Basically, you are handling infrastructure analytics. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we we do uh, our today's our core business is in the rail sector. Mm-hmm. We do rail tracks for track geometry for maintenance. Mm-hmm. We do uh, clearance gauging software. We do both hardware and software. We do um, uh, infrastructure health monitoring. Mm-hmm. We do event monitorings for the level crossings. And uh, we have also moved into the into uh, the highways, uh, roads, bridges, where we do bridge joints, very high accuracy uh, data uh, data surveying, so that that can be used for uh, multiple preventive maintenance mm-hmm. uh, situations. We also uh, do similar work in Japan as well as in US. Mm-hmm. So these are our three core markets currently, but the opportunities are everywhere, including India. Imagine. So massive. I can imagine. So I remember, you know, uh, as a child, they used to see when rails, railway lines used to look at maintenance, there used to be this tiny little trolley with four people sitting on top and one yes. guy running behind. Yes. You know, it, but my it is still around. It is still around, but it's still it's, around. But the, yeah, but the technology is kind of getting in and you can start seeing, especially for high speed trains, it is now a regulation, uh, it's a regulatory requirement that we have to use uh, track geometry systems. Very interesting. So the que- my question to you is that how has analytics changed maintenance over the decades? Oh, uh, this, as I said, there are really, really tangible results on safety side, on sustainability side, mm-hmm. and uh, as well as on the saving sides for the total cost of ownership. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it's, uh, I think on even intangibles like safety, 
is, is massive uh, because you don't have to wait till an inspector will go and do the regular checks mm -hmm. as per the plan, as per the schedule. Mm -hmm. Here, you can get the information 24-7. Right. And, and it has really huge benefits. As I mentioned briefly, as technology becomes reliable and cost competitive, I think it's a massive area for the growth for the whole industry. Interesting. And uh, what are some of the challenges that you face in, in the business? I think it's uh, more the cultural part of it. Uh, how would we move from established mm -hmm. system for decades? And same from the supplier side and from the user side. Mm -hmm. uh, I think how we make sure the transition is smoother and uh, it's not a sudden situation where people mm -hmm. kind of are not um, ready to take the new ways of doing things. So uh, I would say cultural is a big thing. And also, uh, I think technology definitely is actually um, becoming reliable and cost competitive. And also, to be honest, in a, in a positive way, the COVID has actually accelerated mm -hmm. the using of the technology. So it is what you would have thought that uh, maybe it will take five to 10 years, maybe it take less now, because I now see more and more interest mm -hmm. from both sides. Can't we use it faster? Can we do it uh, now? So, so there are positive signs towards it. So, you know, you mentioned that you are focused on the US, the UK, the US and Japan. Yes. And if you look at, say, infrastructure in the US, you know, it is, it was built uh, more than 40, 50 years ago. Yes. Uh, and, you know, the US president has said that he's going to spend over a couple of trillion dollars on yeah, yeah. the and to, you know, making the infrastructure modern again. Uh, what is, how is technology going to drive maintenance of infrastructure? I think for, there will be obviously two sides to the, to the new structures. I think it will be much easier. It will be part of the design and it's already happening. In most of the new iconic bridges or structures, we now start putting in the sensors uh, during the design and construction phase. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the established refurbished market, uh, I think it's more for the safety. Mm -hmm. Very, very important that uh, we can track uh, uh, the structure situation of the bridge or a structure uh, or a rail track uh, so that uh, we can avoid uh, unfortunate accidents or anything. So I think it can play a role in both areas mm -hmm. to kind of uh, manage from safety point as well as manage for long-term sustainability point of view. So for our viewers and listeners, can you give me uh, an example of uh, you know, where your technology is being used? I mean, a live example without giving names, of course, because that must be confident. Mm. Oh, we, are, we have a pretty, uh, quite a good, uh, uh, what's the right word? quite a good uh, reference sites in UK because it was started 20 years back mm -hmm. in UK. So where we, we can actually track most of the rail roads of UK uh, in thousands of miles mm -hmm. where we take uh, every day 25 terabytes of data at least. Wow. So it can go up to 200 terabytes. Mm -hmm. And then we have also put the deep learning AI on it so that we can actually point out uh, all the maybe displacements or cracks or fasteners are not properly tightened mm -hmm. and things like that. We can actually look at it and provide the information to the operators mm -hmm. so that uh, they take a necessary maintenance before they again run the trains, passenger trains. So yeah, you, we do also the clearance there in Tokyo Metro, we do a couple of projects uh, with these. And US, we are doing a trial with a large freight train company. So, so tell me, you know, when, when you say that you are able to get sensors across the entire railway uh, network, mm. setting up that infrastructure to track and to get your 200 terabytes of data must be quite a big exercise, isn't it? I mean, the entire railway network has to have your sensors. There are two, yeah, there are two um, elements. Uh, for the measurement systems, what we do is we actually 
uh, install uh, on a special train, uh, service train, we call them, uh, a laser and video cameras uh, where they take the, the picture, 3D picture of the whole ray track while the train is moving. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the massive data database. Okay. And that is also a spatial database uh, so that we need to find the GPS location mm -hmm. where we pick up and all that. And on that data, we use an AI. But also we do um, remote condition monitoring for infrastructure health monitoring. Mm -hmm. In that case, uh, these are the sensors at specific, uh, specific assets, uh, mm -hmm. can be a level crossing, can be a slope, can be vegetation, fencing, mm -hmm. where uh, we provide a linear data. And uh, that is uh, much easier. But I think the complexity is when you do the measurement systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we do both basically. So, and and the interesting bit is the, uh, the things are converging with upfront uh, dashboards. We provide also the portals, mm -hmm. and then it makes much easier for operation level, management level, and executive level to make those decisions. Uh, like it for the executive level is more about safety, mm -hmm. corporate social responsibility, so they can have that kind of a rag report dashboard so that they can know anytime. And for the management, it's more return on investment, financials, mm -hmm. and planning for the cost for the next five to 10 years. And for the operation level, is the technology, how fast can we do, it is reliable, easy to use, easy to uh, repair and install. So, yeah. Very interesting. And when, you know, when I was reading about you, uh, one of the things that came up was that you were able to optimize your costs because of your large network. Yes. Help me understand how you would do that. In a number of ways, it might have upfront higher costs, right? Because you're using a technology, hardware, software. Mm -hmm. But if you see the if you see the total ownership for ten years or twenty years life cycle of uh, technology on the train or on the structures, you can start thinking about uh, basically if you start getting information upfront about some cracks or displacement or some other uh, issues. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you have a higher chance that you can actually fix it faster. Now, if you go into traditional model, there is a regular schedule based visits with some instrumentation. So it might be too late by the time you go there, right? So you can, you can save immediately because you get all the time uh, condition monitoring mm -hmm. like a real time. That's one side. The other side is also you put uh, less boots uh, on ground. Huh? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to put on these red zone areas people all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's again, a very, very big important thing uh, in, the, in the infrastructure industry, the safety. Mm -hmm. So safety is like, uh, there is no compromise. It. And, and we can actually provide a lot of technology which can actually improve those. So the saving lives is very, very critical for there. And then uh, finally, it is about uh, how we can utilize our assets, how, how to maximize the value of how we do things, how we we'll run trains on time, how we uh, maybe in the bridges when we know if there are issues at bridge joints, uh, how we kind of make sure that the traffic doesn't get uh, stuck somewhere, that uh, the people on the maintenance side get upfront information mm -hmm. that this is going to break or something. So you remove inconvenience, remove penalties for them. They have heavy penalties if they don't maintain those things. So yeah, the ROI is very easy in this case. It is just it is just going back to the culture and the reliability of the, uh, technology and cost comparison. These three things are happening every day. And I think COVID is accelerating it. So, so I see this is massive. Fascinating. So one more question relating to railways uh, and infrastructure before I move to the yes. next segment. With all this technology, say, and you said you're not in India, um, but will this result in lesser accidents? I mean, not that we've had any major accidents for a long time in India. Well, obviously, yes. You know, with, with the machine data, with the, with the sensing data, it's consistent. It is not based on human error, right? Mm -hmm. You have a good uh, inspector today, tomorrow, maybe you don't. And the data varies depending on capability and quality of the person or the situation that day for the person. But with sensors, once it is uh, kind of configured and, uh, and installed properly, you get consistency of data. Consistency of data will actually create consistency of uh, uh, 
uh, issues, parameters, and inform on time. Mm -hmm. And it gets traceability and gets tra tracking. It raises the alarm to different levels. So yes, definitely. Very interesting. So let me move on now to a few other questions for you. Sure. You know, you've been running large companies for some time. What would you say is your leadership style? I would say very uh, coach, uh, mentor based. I think I work with the team. My whole goal is around how can I make my team successful? Mm -hmm. uh, literally, if I sometimes think about this question and what does it take for me to get up in the morning and go to work? I really thought very seriously about it, like for my last few assignments. And, and you start thinking, actually, a smile on the face of people. You start building up, building that confidence in the team, building that growth. Mm. And then you start, you start body language. People feel happy. They work, like you go extra mile. That is the kind of uh, um, reflection of the leadership. And even if I go further, that uh, once I leave that uh, role or assignment, uh, I see um, that the team there can run it at least three to five years further in according to the plan. So that makes it so happy. I've, I've really become happy that uh, the work was done and there are people. So there's a business continuity, mm. sustainability there. I would say that's the leadership style. Fantastic. So, you know, Sanjay, you worked in several countries and speak many languages. Yes. My question to you is how easy or difficult is it to adjust to so many different cultures when you move? I, I, I should, to be honest, give credit to uh, the upbringing in school and parents, family, and the, the values we have actually, if I go to ancient text of India, right? Uh, they get, we're not taught, though. they get na naturally, yeah? when we talk to people uh, like uh, uh, mutual respect, live and let live, be performance based, mm -hmm. uh, less desired. And they, actually, they are all very critical for the business. Mm. And, and I maybe, I took them literally. Mm. And uh, I, my style is if you choose something to do, then give it 100%. Correct. So, so have less interpretations or legacies that actually go for it, do your best and see how the results come out. So, so that was the reason I could adapt quite fast in different parts of the world, cultures, because my experience, I have actually, I think I have traveled over 75 plus countries, mm -hmm. maybe over 150 cities and all that. If we kind of little bit uh, scratch the upper part of uh, us as human mm -hmm. beings, below that we are all safe. Well, so we have the same challenges, same questions, and and it's uh, it's fascinating that uh, you have to go and learn when you go to these all different countries, and uh, and I feel it fascinating that. Uh, that uh, you can, what you can do in India, you can do it anywhere. Just you have to stand, stand uh, up for your values and, uh, and your Very true. upbringing on these things. Very true. So I'm going to move to the last segment of our conversation, which is some questions sure. to you personally. Sure. Sure. And what you just said uh, is my next question. What are some of the core values? Ah, you believe uh, that, well, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, the number one value uh, is uh, integrity. That mm -hmm. is... Do what you say you will do, like walk the talk. I think that is fundamental. And I don't relate it to morality. Huh? It is pure by nature. If you decide to do something, then go for it. Mm -hmm. I think that is uh, very, very critical in, in any leadership or in any uh, society or human beings as a, as a, as a community. Okay. And uh, I would, uh, from the business leadership point of view, I would add to that, uh, I think, uh, this whole whole idea about how you could actually make others successful, mm -hmm. right? That is like a, um, like your core to you that you would you would definitely uh, share the knowledge, help others to see how you can do that. That's very very important. Mm -hmm. Then I think also relationships, collaboration, how we can collaborate with people, mm -hmm. not necessarily to everything you have to do yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also, whatever you choose uh, to do, and then you are 
kind of in existence there. You are present there. You have that high energy. So, so basically, it's inspirational, integrity, relationships, and uh, existence. Those are kind of core. Interesting. And uh, a follow-up question to that would be that, you know, for someone like you who has worked across continents, led large companies, from where you stand today, what does success mean to you? Uh, I, I think that that core for that fundamental, what I mentioned, but you, you go to an office, any office, and you see people smiling, mm. people going extra mile, and, and trying to solve some of the problems, right? Like in this current uh, assignment, mm -hmm. uh, you, you see that uh, people see a purpose, how can we make sa everyone's life safe, mm -hmm. right? Software programming writing with this whole thing, this might save somebody's life yeah. uh, or how we make things effective. So you, if you see that happening in an organization, uh, that gives to me the joy and the results, honestly, they happen oh, yes. very rarely the top line, bottom line, they, actually are the outcomes when you have such an environment. Fascinating. And uh, my follow-up question to that again would be who or what inspires you? I think uh, making, raising the bar and giving a possibility to other people is one big thing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, diverse, uh, diversity, inclusion. Um, I think that, uh, that how can we actually uh, stretch ourselves to create that value for others that it, uh, it becomes something for our next generation mm -hmm. better safer environment so they can continuously improve and keep on improving the things wonderful so i have now time for two more questions for you sure my next question is is a question on failure yeah um, and i've often said uh, that people in south asia don't teach children it's okay to fail we are always taught come first, go to the head of the line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, yet we fail, we make mistakes. My question to you, Sanjay, is: What have been some of your learnings from some of your mistakes? I I think uh, obviously, if we if we don't fail, <laughs> we won't learn, and okay. we won't be innovative. We won't mm -hmm. be creative. So uh, obviously, um, there is uh, always uh, I'm strong believer. Mm -hmm. That uh, at least from the business point of view, when these large corporations have established business, right? Obviously, uh, the the style, behaviors, values will be more how to run it more effective, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe uh, if it is a pretty kind of a high barrier industry or regulated industry. Uh, even they become more admin type, more bureaucratic, less risk. risk. They become completely risk averse. Even in that context, I say your tomorrow's business, which I call explore business, should have entrepreneurial and high risk. If you don't have it, uh, it will fail. So, so I coming back to me on these because I came across such things because during my younger days, I was quite all rounder playing uh, hockey and mm -hmm. traveling and all that. So, so many cases where it was a mistake. <laughs> luckily, my parents didn't kind of uh, try to stop me, but uh, I was very lucky that way. Go ahead and do it, doesn't matter. And, and you learn from those failures, your confidence, no, I'll fight it out and all that. So, yeah, there has been Wonderful. so many failures, yeah. Terrific. Terrific. And my last question to you, and this is for the thousands of people who will listen to our conversation. Yes. Uh, you've reached right to the apex of not just one, but multiple companies across continents. What would your advice be to a young manager, a young individual starting off on her or his corporate career um, now? Yeah. I would say take risk. Don't, don't wait for your boss to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Take risk. Be proactive, go out, try, uh, find an early mentor that also helps. And, uh, and uh, don't, uh, don't worry about failure. Huh? Just mm -hmm. uh, learn from it. That's a step to the next uh, 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 problem you will resolve. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I would also say, uh, considering the, the, the the way we are in the world now, uh, focus on certain things. Huh? 
like a little bit like uh, be be obviously very clear on what you will do and what you will not do mm-hmm. and and finally uh, just when when you have a possibility have some savings so that uh, at least for a year so that you can stand up for any pressures you get from the corporate world mm-hmm. so you don't have to give up on your values mm-hmm. so those kind of things will be advice sanjay thank you so much it's been such a pleasure, pleasure speaking Always a pleasure. thank you very much and a tremendous learning for me uh, good luck thank you thank you have a good day thank bye you. wonderful Thank you for listening to the brand called You video cast and podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.